Uh, we are fortunate enough to have Mandy Wright, uh, who this past December traveled uh, to the Middle East with the American Council of Young Political Leaders. And the ACYPL is a nonpartisan nonprofit that takes nominations from alumni of the program to travel to various parts of the world. The United States has strong foreign policy, with which the United States has strong uh, foreign policy ties. Only seven travelers from the USA, 25 to 40 years old, and connected to local, state, or national politics are chosen for each delegation. The purpose of this program is to have the opportunity to learn in person about political, economic, and cultural issues that affect the region and U.S. policy. Unless you have been living in a cave somewhere, you know that the Middle East is very tied to U.S. foreign policy uh, and affects us every day in lots of ways. And Mandy's going to give us her impressions of, of what she experienced in her person-to-person -person, um, visit to the Middle East, to Jordan, Israel, and the West Bank. We welcome Mandy Wright. Well, thank you very much for coming. And I have to say, just from greeting the crowd, it seems as though I should give a speech about Norway tonight, because I see so many Norwegian sweaters in the crowd, and just, frankly, Norwegians. I know you're out there. Um, so, good night. <laughs> Um, but this is a little talk about the Middle East, and uh, I also have to preface this with, I was in the Middle East for two weeks, and I know in this crowd there are people who are true experts on the Middle East. So I will be very frank about this was my experience, two weeks traveling um, to three very interesting places, and... Uh, I think there are some really great people who will also help facilitate further discussion as we move into our dinner. Um, I also want to start off by thanking you because this program um, is actually partially through the federal government, partially from private donations. And I was chosen because I was elected. So if you voted for me, thank you. You gave me a ticket to the Middle East. <laughs> and if you didn't vote for me, I assume at some point you paid some federal taxes, so also thank you. <laughs> Nobody needs to feel left out in sending me on this trip. Okay, so here we go. Um, so the basics of this trip are, uh, uh, we already had a pretty good outline of just what it entailed. Um, we spent four days in each place, and we uh, here's the itinerary, and I must say that there was little debriefing. <laughs> we went, um, the seven of us who were chosen, we went to D.C., and we spent about a day and a half there, and we met with some of the foreign consulates and got some ideas about, you know, what, we'd, what we would be seeing and what we would be interacting with, but this program is specifically meant to sort of throw you into the situation where you don't have a lot of background information. In fact, if anyone had traveled to this area or spoke the languages, they were disqualified. Um, so I just say that to preface a little bit of my naivete about the area. <laughs> and, uh, and yet I learned a lot. It really was an incredible program. So here we go. Um, First things first, we went to the Palestinian territories. And we were mostly on the West Bank, and I just put this map up here, because of course, just a quick reminder, there is Gaza, the Gaza Strip, as well as the West Bank. And uh, we went just as the Gaza war was wrapping up. I would say it had been wrapped up for a month or two, but not the wounds were still very fresh. Um, when we first arrived, we went to Ramallah. This is one of my traveling companions, and I'll sort of introduce you to them as we go through. Uh, this actually is Ryan. He's a state representative from Pennsylvania and a Republican. And we got along very well. It was actually quite fun to travel with uh, somebody from the other side of the aisle who wasn't from Wisconsin because it just all wasn't so personal. It was really nice. Um, <laughs> it was really nice. Uh, we could agree on just about everything, actually. Um, 
So here we are in Ramallah, and uh, this was a great picture. This is actually at a, uh, a museum for uh, a poet who was Palestinian and recorded the experience of being Palestinian. And um, we started in Ramallah, and we very quickly went to the headquarters of the PLO. This was on our first day. And so this was incredible. We actually had uh, been scheduled to meet with Mahmoud Abbas. He needed to cancel. He got a little busy with something and couldn't, and didn't have the time to meet with us. I'm sure it was legitimate. Um, but we met with uh, several secretaries, and um, it just it was a very interesting experience to hear and be in the building of the PLO, which is, of course, famous, uh, and hear what they had to say. And we had quite a few debriefings from PLO members. I'll move on. This is Dr. Ashrahi. Ashrawi, thank you. And um, she is very influential in Palestine. She met with us individually. And uh, she's very passionate, very articulate, and very political about why Palestine deserves sovereignty. Um, and she, uh, she gave us some interesting perspectives. Some of the things that she talked about were, of course, so first of all, there is... I'm going to go back really quickly to this map, just because I'm going to assume you don't all understand these politics too well. So um, if you look on the left, and I apologize, this is a very small map, but on the left kind of shows the West Bank territory. And that line is basically something called the Green Line. And that was um, from 1976. 67, thank you, <laughs> 67, and it was basically agreed upon in 67. Since then, however, there's been a lot of changes, and part of those changes include settlements. Uh, Israel has settled further and further into the Western Bank territory, and that has created a lot of political tension um, for good reason. And so a lot of what the good doctor talked about was how damaging these settlements have been. And as we uh, got to know people throughout the West Bank, that really was a very common theme and something that you hear in national politics as well, um, or international politics, is the settlements were very strategic. Uh, they often were to take over large population areas, and they often were to take over natural resources, which were very important. For example, water, because we're in the desert. Um, and so she was really passionate about how, um, how strategic Israel was in expanding into the Palestinian territories and how that was creating a system of oppression. Next place we went to was Hebron. It's a really famous old city. And we actually went to uh, the ancient city of Hebron. And there still is some commerce there, although it used to be much, much busier. And so it's just a couple fun pictures of walking through the old city of Hebron and the spices and the animals. Um, but as you can see, much of it is shuttered. And this is actually a city that goes back to the Roman times. And what was really, really interesting is our tour guide was this woman. Her name is Sarah. And she works for the city of Hebron. She actually works for the mayor of Hebron. And she was explaining to us how the city had been divided um, by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And although it is completely in the uh, Palestinian territories, there is a settlement that's basically right there. And in fact, if I go back... You can't quite see it, but a little bit further on. Um, the reason that it's it's down low is because it's such an ancient city, and then the city has the modern city has built up on top of it. And so, where the Israeli settlement was was up higher, and the ancient city, which is basically the Palestinian city, was below. And where that green tarp was, at some points there was also sort of fencing, and it was really kind of gross. Like we were walking there, and we were like, "What's up there?" It looked like a lot of garbage, and it was garbage because literally the settlers, the Israeli settlers, were throwing their trash on the Palestinians. And I was like, "That's gross." And then people would say, "Yeah," and they throw their feces on us too. And I was like, "Really? That's unbelievable." Um, and there were many other situations like that where it just was 
really uncomfortable to be there. You really felt uh, the aggression and you really kind of, I really empathized with the Palestinians and how difficult their situation was. So back to Sarah. Um, her story was particularly compelling because there's those, you know, there's those little examples which are obviously dramatic and disturbing. Um, but sh she is standing here, and this is the sit this is the uh, road actually where she grew up, and she no longer lives here. She grew up on the other side of that wall. And what happened in Hebron is there were some riots that had to do uh, with Palestinians and Jews, and. Um, Previously, they had lived together peacefully for, you know, centuries. And, uh, and she talks about how it was such a busy, thriving area of commerce. And her family owned a gas station on the other side of that wall. And then one day there were riots and there was violence. And the city came in and they said, we can't have this anymore. We can't have this violence. We're going to shut it off. And they built this wall. And it's been there for about 30 years. And her family's gas station is on the other side. And they had to leave immediately, and she's never been back. And she still remembers as a child what it was like to have that business, that place of, of business, and what that did to her family because that was their source of income. And uh, I just think that's really indicative because you hear a lot about the wall, right? And I think um, the wall is there to protect people, but the wall, walls, you know, metaphorical walls as well as physical walls also really damage people and inhibit their ability to lead healthy lives and be independent. And something else that I thought was really fascinating is they talked about how these walls had now changed the infrastructure of the city because this ancient city had had a really interesting aqueduct system so that when it rained and it flooded, it all, you know, it all just kind of cleansed the city. But now these walls served as dams, and it backed it up so that it actually became stagnant water, like waist high. And people who had shops would lose all their things. It would all be ruined, and they couldn't get out, and it, you know, and it was mixing with the sewage, and, and it just, it was really a terrible situation, and they asked, and they asked, and they asked if they could drill holes in the walls just to release the water, at least, and it wasn't allowed. And um, there were just, there were a lot of very interesting circumstances where it seemed very obvious, very matter-of-fact. Of course you would let people do this. Of course you would, and it, it wasn't allowed. Um, we also had the opportunity to sort of get a glimpse into the future of Palestine. So obviously Palestine is uh, very important historically. This was a factory, it's called the Royal Factory. This is my friend Emily Burke is her last name, ironically. She is a Republican <laughs> from Southern Illinois. So we had a few chuckles because it was right after the election. Um, and, uh, and we went to this factory called Royal. And it's enormous. They make almost everything for Palestine. Um, we walk through. They, they literally make just about everything because there's very, very few industries which can survive in the, in the business climate of Palestine. There's really high taxes. Um, the borders are uh, very restrictive. Often it's difficult to transport items, goods, people even within the borders. Um, much less outside of the Palestinian borders. So this factory has found a way, and they just kind of figure out the next product and then flood the market and figure out the next product and flood the market, and they kind of make everything. It was really interesting. Um, and just to show how pervasive they are, they have everything also at their factory. They employed thousands of people, and you can even get your hair cut at your job if you'd like. Um, and also we went to a small brewery in Taipei, which translates to good. And it was actually an American woman who was married to a Palestinian man who run this brewery uh, in the place about the size of my two-car garage. And they supply beer all over Palestine. It was a fascinating story. They were very friendly, very welcoming. But they also had some very difficult stories because, of course, um, beer is something that can spoil. And so as they were looking to expand their markets and they would run into the problem of, you know, they needed to cross the Israeli border and then there would be an arbitrary reason for their shipment being stopped up for six hours or two days, they would lose their entire shipment. Um, and they were actually expanding into other Middle Eastern countries, which I didn't really understand. It seems sort of impossible. <laughs> but they were, uh, they were motivated enough to do it and successful and uh, they were really nice. 
And I, I added this picture. I didn't actually take any pictures of this place, but it's really, this was one of the most fascinating places we visited in just the four days we were there. This is a city called Rawabi. And um, Rawabi is actually Palestinian, uh, but it is the, as far as I know, the only new Palestinian city that's being built. It is being built for, uh, to hold millions of people, and kind of the idea was to do a reverse settlement. Well, if the Israelis are coming in and settling on our land, why don't we settle on our land? Uh, why don't we find a way to make this work? And there is one multimillionaire Palestinian man who has some strong ties to Qatar and uh, was able to get the funding to make this happen. This is a multi-billion dollar project. And the hoops that they had to jump through were absolutely incredible to make this work. They have their own stone factory here. Um, electricity, they have internet, high-speed internet, they're building a city center, there's actually an amphitheater, the only, the largest amphitheater in the entire Middle East is here so that they can have community gatherings. And um, there was one thing holding it all up, and that was they had had an agreement uh, with the Israelis that they would be able to tap into a water source, which was about a mile away. And um, they had built the pipeline, and they, by the way, they used all Palestinian labor for this entire project. They had built the pipeline, and they had people lined up to start living in the apartments, and those people had paid half their down payment, and then they were waiting until they could move in to pay the other half. So some of the financing for the project was dependent on people being able to move in in sort of those first waves and then fund the rest of the project. And um, Israel held up the water, and they held it up for more than a year. And when we visited, it was actually at this stage, it was this far built, and they didn't have water. And if they didn't get water, the entire thing was going to go through because no one would live in a place where they didn't have access to water. Uh, and it just, to me, it was a very, very interesting example of how when you have all, all the power, um, the, the scales are so unbalanced. It's not fair. And you can say that, you know, if you have all the power, you might be, you might be judicious. You might, uh, you might look out for people's best interests. But we just saw many, many examples of, of that not happening. So I'm happy to say that I just got an email from my traveling companions today. And because Netanyahu is coming to give his already infamous speech before he even gives it um, to our Congress, uh, he was trying to make some overtures of peace, and he has turned on the water spigot for this project today. And so this city will be successful, and people will be able to move in very soon. Yeah. So we were there in uh, December, and um, we actually got to go to Bethlehem. Here was the Christmas tree outside the Church of Bethlehem, and here is the Church of the Nativity um, I'll run through this kind of quickly because there's so much history here to talk about. And um, I took this picture because I thought it was really fascinating, the different doors that lead into the Church of the Nativity. You can see the old door with the old stones, that big old one. Um, and that used to allow horses through. And then they had problems with that because of the Crusaders, of course, right? So then they made a smaller door, and that used to allow people to go through. But then they had problems with that because of armies. And so then they built a smaller door, so you have to bend over. And I just thought that was such an interesting narrowing of uh, access as they had problems with people coming in year after year. So it's an incredibly beautiful religious site. I took a lot of pictures, um, but... I left a lot of them out, honestly. Um, this is the place that actually takes you down to the place where supposedly Jesus was born. So there's an, uh, an incredibly ornate church, and then there's sort of this very interesting convex set of steps. And you walk down, and it looks like a fireplace I'm, that I'm standing next to. And what I really liked about this is that for, even for me, and I don't consider myself a particularly religious person, I mean, you know, everybody has their own degrees of um, what they believe, 
But even for me, it was an experience because it was a physical experience. And I really appreciated that it was an actual physical experience to walk down these steps. And then if you look down in the ground, there's this uh, silver plated sort of sun looking thing coming out and there's a hole in there. And you have to get down on your hands and knees and reach down in there. And there's sort of all these candles around there. So you, it feels like you're sort of crawling into a fireplace. It really does. And then you reach down and your arm goes way down, like really deep. And then you touch the stone where supposedly Jesus was born. And I just thought it was so fascinating, kind of a reverse birth experience, right? Reaching way down in there and actually touching the stone. I, I thought that was fascinating. And obviously is a very famous place. A reference to the Crusades there. And this is the old city in Jerusalem. We also uh, got to tour um, the Stations of the Cross. This is actually a rather new mosaic, but it's uh, extremely ornate. It was enormous. It was probably as large as this wall behind the stage. And we had the opportunity to go to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, where um, Jesus died and was buried, and we could actually walk in and touch the stone, and there was the big stone that was rolled away, and that was really incredible. We were fortunate that we were there shortly after the Gaza War because there was very little tourism, so we got to go through all the tourist um, places very quickly. And then, of course, this is uh, the very famous Western Wall. Um, some people call it the Wailing Wall, and it's uh, one of the most religious places in the world uh, especially for the Jewish faith. And it is literally steps away from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and supposedly where Jesus died and was buried and on the cross and all of those, the stations of the cross. I was really shocked at how close, just the physical proximity of it all. And then there are also some very important mosques. That's not actually the most important mosque. But um, having all three uh, religion so very close together uh, creates a lot of issues, as you well know if you pay attention um, to the Middle East. And it was it was wonderful to be there, interesting to hear uh, the different perspectives of all the religions, and um, interesting how many of them uh, were very ter territorial and how they worked out who was responsible for what. You can't see it very well, but right behind here, there's actually this rickety old bridge that goes up to the uh, Western Wall. And while we were there, there were there's there has been a sort of a gentleman's agreement apparently that um, you know Jewish people have this section and Christians have this section and the Muslims can pray in this area and we all just sort of respect our space. Um, but there had been this really rickety bridge built up next to the Western Wall and Jewish people would go and feel the need to actually touch the Western Wall and it would create riots and sometimes violence because some people felt that it was their God-given right to go and do this and other people felt they were violating this sort of gentleman's agreement and there were, you know, people would die over um, this situation. And there was a lot of concern that it would escalate, that it would very quickly escalate into a much larger conflict. Um, after four days in the Palestinian territories, we went to Israel. And I must say, it was a little bit shocking. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had been in Palestine, and we went right to the Senate, uh, which is also called the Knesset in Israel. And it's a unicameral house. That means they don't have uh, bi we're bicameral, they're just unicameral. Cameral, that means they just have one house of power or um, the legislature. And I must say, you know, we'd been hearing about all these water concerns, and we heard a lot from, uh, you know, farmers who were Palestinian who had had their lemon farms, their lemon tree farms for generations. And now the Israelis had taken over the water source that they had traditionally used and only allowed to use it uh, once a week. And they had to pay for it. And before they hadn't had to pay for it. And so they couldn't afford to farm anymore. So they were ripping out their trees. And, um, you know, it just, it was this unbelievably huge concern, access to water. And then we went across the border, and truly, we it was only about two hours away, we got to Israel, and we got to this building, and it was a big building, um, at least as large as our city hall in Wausau, and there was water shooting up on this dome of a roof, just 
shooting up. And I, I asked our tour guide, I said, am I missing something? <laughs> Is there a purpose for that water on top of that building? And he was like, oh, it's, it's just for decoration. Isn't it beautiful? And I was like, unbelievable. You know, like we were just in another place where people are really, truly desperate for water. Um, and uh, the Israeli Senate was beautiful, but you know, literally there were like petunias uh, in the boulevard. It was just so much different. It was such a different way of living. Um, so when we met with members of the Knesset, uh, which was really fantastic, really interesting, first of all, in the building, it's all bombproof. And the rooms that we met are, were all you know, bombproof and uh, had special filtration systems and everything, just in case. And uh, we actually had the opportunity to hear a member of the Likud party and a member of the Labor Party debate. And that was particularly fascinating because they were two uh, pretty high-ranking members in each of their party. And um, they were really brilliant. They really debated. It wasn't like American debates. They really knew what they were talking about. And it was really... <laughs> You didn't hear me say that, but <laughs> uh, they really um, they really had a lot of information, and it was fun. We all agreed, all of us on this trip, and this is this is my delegation right here. We all agreed that that was one of the highlights is just getting to listen to them debate for an hour. And um, so, you know, one thing that was really fascinating was how we sort of saw the progression of foreign policy as we went from one place to another. So in, in Palestine, everybody basically said, our number one concern is Israel. And if we could work out things with Israel, whatever that means, if we become sovereign, if it's a two-state solution, whatever that is, that's our number one concern. We need to resolve that before we can move on. And then um, we went to Israel. And I was kind of expecting to hear that their issue was Palestine, too. Nope. Uh, their issue was Iran. And if Iran has nuclear capacity, how will they deal with that? Much less the rest of the Islamic world, because they're right at the doorstep and they feel very alienated, and they are constantly worried that they will be obliterated, somewhat for good reason. Um, so this is, we actually got to go into uh, the house where they debate, which was quite interesting. Um, got a tour. And then we got back out, uh, which was good. <laughs> it's always good to get back out into the real world. And so this is um, a town, it's called Sederat. Sederat. Uh, and this was our tour guide. He was great, Baruch. And um, he took us to the city because he had done a lot of work here um, with children, and there are a lot of children who live in Israel who are really traumatized by bombings, you know? Um, so, of course, you're aware of the Iron Dome, and a lot of U.S. funds go towards uh, securing the Iron Dome, but the Iron Dome, which is a set of basically counter rockets, right? So they know that they're going to be bombed, and they can sense it, and then they can shoot rockets and explode it in the air so it doesn't actually detonate on the ground and hurt anybody. Um, it's successful about 98% of the time, but they still have a fair amount of bombings. And... Um, there is a warning system in case that it's not going to be successful. And in this town, I believe the warning time was only about five seconds because they're very close to Gaza. And they're one of the largest populations that is so close to Gaza, so they get bombed a lot. And so it's a pretty large town. I, I want to say it was about as large as Wausau. And they had trained the children. So this is a playground for the children. They had trained the children that when they hear the alarms to run into the play structures because they turned all the play structures into bomb shelters. And so hopefully they would be able to protect the children from the shrapnel um, or the bomb itself uh, by running into the play structures. And I, as a mother of a six-year-old, eight-year-old, and 12-year-old, was a little aghast. I mean, it's really hard to imagine actually having your children in a place where you know that they are um, susceptible to being bombed. Uh, the, the bus stops at the local high school were also bomb shelters, so that when kids were waiting outside for the bus, they, um, they would be protected because they had actually had a death there. Uh, but it was also fascinating because the city, and it, this isn't a good picture of it, but the city was constantly rebuilding. They had, it was just cranes everywhere. And um, that was a really fascinating thing about Israel in general, is they just, you know, 
overwhelming odds. It's true. Um, and they just really, truly don't give up. They just keep growing and growing and growing. So this is a, actually a kibbutz. And a kibbutz was very interesting to learn about. It's a, you know, interesting political background and basically how Israel started in these uh, self-sufficient, basically, communes. And uh, they sort of staked out the territory of Israel and created a nation state um, from these very self-sufficient communities, the kibbutz. And so at this kibbutz, it's literally like half a mile away from Gaza. And um, they too had had a lot of bombings. And so we went there and um, this man who was the leader of the kibbutz and they democratically reelect different leaders all the time, but he was the leader. This is actually his child. And this is the kindergarten and this is the outside because they have huge concrete walls to protect the children everywhere. Um, and uh, he said that they all walk as close as possible to places of safety. And their warnings are only about three seconds. And just a year ago, they did have like a four-year-old die from shrapnel. Um, so it's just, it's really, you know, I was in Palestine and I really empathized with the Palestinians. And then I was in Israel and it was really hard to hear these stories too. And um, you really empathize with that too. So these were pictures. This is actually new after the last child had died. This uh, new kindergarten, they kind of called it. So they were talking about how, hey, walls can be friendly. <laughs> Look at, we painted them for the children. Isn't this great? It's good that we live with walls, which was interesting. Um, and we had the opportunity to go to a Shabbat dinner. This, uh, this is actually in Jerusalem. Uh, that was quite fun. And we went to see, uh, where are we? We went to see the grottos. This is right next, this is far north, far north, right next to Lebanon. Um, and the Mediterranean Sea, of course, is beautiful. And I thought, you know, the natural aspects of Israel, I hadn't really heard of it before. Our tour guide actually uh, was a bit of a naturalist, and so he wished he could have taken us hiking and doing more things, and I wish he could have as well. It was really beautiful. It was very interesting. Um, and then uh, we were at a university. Actually, at this particular university, this is an Israeli university, uh, they were talking to us about the propaganda against Israelis that Palestinians um, use. And of course, we heard that on the other side as well, that there's a lot of propaganda against Palestinians that the Israelis use. And you could really see it actually in the media and in the popular literature and their cartoons. So that was interesting, but this particular professor um, we had different leaders of the day, and we had to give a gift to whoever we were talking to. And so I had a Dave Obi book <laughs> that I had taken along. And I just, you know, I thought, oh, well, this will be nice. You know, he's a professor. He might enjoy this. And I gave it to him, and he said, oh, I have met Dave Obi. And I was like, really? And he had met him several times. And so he had a book that he signed for me, which maybe when I see Dave Obi again, I will show him. Um, Pretty interesting. This is actually the uh, Israeli Chamber of Commerce. We met with the Israeli Chamber of Commerce, the president of the Israeli Chamber of Commerce. There was a funny moment when the president said, oh, you're from Wisconsin. I've been to Wisconsin. And I said, oh, who did you meet with? <laughs> and he had met with some sort of low member uh, cabinet person that I didn't know, um, but it was pretty funny. Uh, he ha actually, the Israeli Chamber of Commerce had come to Wisconsin to learn about our um, seed research and what our University of Madison um, School of Agriculture had done to develop various seeds, uh, because of course agriculture is very important in Israel if you weren't aware it's it's a huge deal. And then this is the ancient city of Akko, which was absolutely fascinating. I wish we would have been able to spend more time there and learn more about it. Another um, very interesting place. It's actually where you hear of the Knights Hospitalier and the Knights Templar. And we walked through the tunnel where the Knights Templar had buried their treasures. It had been unearthed, and it was all gone, of course. But it was, it was fascinating. Um, some great spices I bought, some great food. I love the bright colors. <laughs> and here we are in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is our group. I'll just take, I'll just take a moment to introduce you to all of my traveling companions because it really was a very important part of the trip for me. Um, so on the left is Emily Burke. She was a, a 
County Representative um, in Southern Illinois, Republican. Next is Julia, and she uh, works in Washington, D.C. with the Department of Commerce. So she travels internationally and um, prepares the, the trips for high-ranking members of the Department of Commerce. That was very interesting. Um, she considers herself a Democrat. Then there's me, and then there's Ryan from Pennsylvania I introduced you to. That's Justin Gray. His father was one of the first African-American uh, members of Congress. He now works in D.C., and he's a lobbyist, and he represents entities um, such as the, uh, the country of Morocco. So he was a very interesting person to travel with. He had a lot of foreign um, policy experience that was really valuable. Um, and then there's Chris Obenshine. He was a really wonderful character. He's uh, from Virginia, and so we had a Virginia fact of the day every single day. <laughs> and uh, uh, and he was, he's actually the president of the Republican Party of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and his uncle had founded the Republic, or like renewed the Republican Party in the city of Richmond, Virginia. So we got lots of good facts about that as well. And, uh, and then there was our fearless leader on the end. And he had actually traveled on other trips before. Um, Joseph, he works for the uh, Iowa... I should know this because we all introduced ourselves about 50 times, but um, the Chamber of Commerce for his city, which will come to me in a moment. Um, but he had worked for Senator Harkin previously, and so he also had a lot of foreign policy experience. So part of the really great um, part of this trip is because we had generally four, six, sometimes even eight meetings a day. It was really intense. We met with a lot of high-level people. I didn't take a lot of pictures in all those meetings because it would be a little awkward to pull out my cell phone while we're meeting with very important people. But um, it was great to have the opportunity to understand how to navigate those situations and good questions. And I learned a lot from my traveling companions. Okay, and then um, the third place we went to was Jordan, and we all were a little bit unsure what to expect from Jordan, because obviously pa Palestine and Israel, everybody knows about that relationship. Um, we first met actually with the U.S. ambassador to Jordan. She was fantastic, Alice Wells. She, uh, she had just begun recently, and um, she explained some really interesting things to us about Jordan. So when Israel became a nation, Part of that was because they truly pushed Palestinians out of Palestine. If you want to, you know, it depends on the terminology and what you really believe, who belongs where, and there's a lot of politics behind it. But basically, the indigenous people of Palestine were pushed out. Um, over 420 villages were raised, literally, like, demolished. And a lot of those people ended up as refugees in Jordan. And that has become, in many ways, sort of the populace of Jordan, because before that, Jordan was, in my understanding, largely nomadic. And so then they had all these refugees. And when we went, they had a whole new crop of refugees also from Iraq and Syria because of ISIS. And what uh, the ambassador explained to us right away, and everyone that we met with reiterated, is that their current population in Jordan is 20% refugees that have come within just the past year. And these are refugees of desperation. They come with nothing. They're not wealthy refugees. Um, so Jordan is in a fascinating situation trying to deal with all these refugees of mostly ISIS and the terrorism around them. So this is the hotel we stayed in, in Amman. This is just uh, the view. and. Four million people live in Amman, that's the capital of Jordan. And I took this picture because I was absolutely shocked, first of all, at how far it went. But what you can't really see from the picture are those, um, those hills in the distance. Those are also all filled with buildings. That's also the city of Amman. Very little urban planning. It's the third most water poor country in the world. So they have very few water resources. Um, it was really crowded. It was really, really crowded. People ask me a lot, did you feel, you know, did you feel nervous? Were you in danger? 
I never felt endangered until I went to Jordan and I felt like I couldn't walk on the street. Like the, the cars were crazy. Like I literally, it was just like, I, I can't take a walk here. It's just, it's so busy. There's so many cars, there's so much traffic. It was so crowded. Um, so I'm gonna move quickly, you know, um, we saw some really interesting things. Some of the things that I really thought were fascinating about this place in Jordan is what they were doing um, to gain legitimacy. So they are, uh, when we went, the U.S. had just made a commitment the week before to double our foreign aid. And I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but it was a lot of money. It's one of uh, the most invested in countries for the U.S. in the entire world. And um, some things that they're doing is not only are they accepting refugees, uh, they work very hard to be sort of neutral in this very difficult zone. They are considered the peacemakers of the Middle East. And um, it is a kingdom, but they are working towards democracy in a very interesting way. And so they're, they've got this whole... Uh, strategy and we went to a meeting and there were a lot of people working on the national anti-corruption strategy. Um, because of course, when there are lots of foreign aid donations, one of the biggest concerns is that that money will be taken for corruption. And unfortunately, it does happen sometimes. And so how do you engender the trust so that you continue to receive the aid so that you can service people who really truly are desperate because a good 20% of their population are these really truly desperate refugees. And they understand that if they don't take them, they will die or they will become more radicalized. So it's not a good situation for them not to take the refugees, and yet their capacity is only so large. So how can they um, build the international trust? I also really like this picture because we were in so many meetings, but this is the only one where they translated our names into Arabic. So that's my name and title at the time in Arabic, and I thought that was really cool. I still have that. <laughs> okay, and uh, these are some of the members of the Anti-Corruption Committee. And um, we went to some other really interesting places. We went, uh, I don't have a picture here, but we went to um, a place called Interfaith Studies. And uh, they're working on something called the Amman Message. And the Amman Message is really about bringing together uh, the Muslim faith in Jordan and trying to make sure that it's healthy, you know, and, and not radicalized and, and not, uh, not taken over either by people within the Muslim faith or people without, uh, from outside the Muslim faith uh, who want to define it as a terrorist faith. You know, they're very well aware of this and very concerned about it. Um, and so this organization in particular, I don't have a picture, but I do have some books in the other room. This organization in particular had several strategies, and they were convening many of the um, Muslim leaders from across the Middle East to come and talk about what this meant. But one of the basic tenets that I thought was really fascinating um, was that they wanted to make sure that individual imams could not define the Muslim faith. And at first I thought that was very, I don't know, I just, I didn't understand why would that be so important. And then I realized that, you know, they said, well, if we leave it up to individuals to define it, then they can say, well, you have to do this extreme thing or you're not a true Muslim. And when I started thinking about that, I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of like joining a gang or something, right? You have to do this or you're not part of us. And if they could um, structure what it really meant to be Muslim in a much um, more coherent and uh, you know, just healthier way, um, they could prevent a lot of that extremism, which I thought was fascinating. One of the last places we visited uh, was this nonprofit, and they were working with children, and we were actually there as they were distributing food. And there was a bit of a food riot, actually, while we were there. Um, but they also had a lot of great things to offer. Uh, these kids were working on really cool computer projects, figuring out these 3D programs that I have no clue how to do, so that was pretty cool. And uh, one kid had made this uh, diorama, which I thought was really nice, and a nice way to sort of 
and the presentation because I really, really uh, walked away with a lot of respect for the people that I met, a strong feeling that people want to come together. They want to raise their children. They want to do the right thing. Um, but unfortunately, politics can be really destructive. And if you don't have good political systems for people to engage in and to have their voice heard and to advocate for their needs, it becomes violent. And um, that was probably my biggest takeaway of the entire trip. So I'd be happy to answer a couple questions. Um. Um, we hosted a young man from Palestine, Sammy Thwaba, who was absolutely a genius. And he was so disgusted with his country because of their lack of anything dealing with education. They just did not encourage the kids to learn, according to him. And so I'm really curious if you got into that aspect at all of the education in Palestine. Um, so that was obviously very interesting to me because I'm always interested in education. Most of my traveling companions were very business oriented, so we ended up doing a lot of business tours and visits. Um, but I did ask around a lot, and in Jordan there actually is a movement to reform their education system because it's very much sort of rote learning. And there are some real negatives about if you don't pass this test, you can't get into any kind of school, basically, and you can't do this thing, and you can't do that. And so they were trying to reform it so that they really were following people's interests and not just pushing them into things that they didn't like because they passed the test or they didn't pass the test. Um, in Palestine, the thing that really struck me in terms of education is that I met a lot of people who had far better American degree educations than I do, far better. I met a lot of people with masters and PhDs, young people who had been educated in the US. Um, yeah, right, <laughs> exactly, educated in the US. And so it was, it was really frustrating for them to be in Palestine. A lot of them went back because they felt a, a sense of needing to make that change. And we had some really great conversations about did they feel they had the opportunities to be engaged and. Um, most of them that we talked to had tried politics, been very frustrated with it, just kind of given up and tried investing in their own families or their own business or their own, you know, basically what they control. Um, but there were a lot of engineers. There were a lot of people with very high level degrees. It was interesting. In fact, yeah. I want to say I heard statistic that uh, Palestinians are one of the highest educated populations in the Middle East. Um, Mandy, thank you for your presentation. I think you understood quite a lot for someone who went for two weeks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, one thing, though, that I wanted to point out, you, you used the word bombs when you described, mm. for instance, what was happening in the Israeli town of Sidorot. And it's, I mean, bombs, at least to me, implies airplanes flying over, dropping bombs. It's actually rockets coming, sort of handmade things that the, the Palestinians make and shoot from Gaza. Mm -hmm. And while I don't want to be seen to be uh, defending any form of violence, the Gazans are completely surrounded by the Israelis, and this is kind of their um, extremely frustrated response to not being able to get out of Gaza. They lob these rockets uh, towards Israel, which sometimes strike Siderot. But I think it is a distinction because a bomb is something that comes from an air force. The Palestinians don't have an, is, an air force. And I think that's a distinction that people in the audience might want to be able to yeah. make. Well, and one, uh, one thing that we, uh, all of my traveling companions had the same impression. We left Palestine, we went to the Knesset, and then we went to the Holocaust Museum in Israel that same day. And it was so shocking, right? Because first of all, it's a Holocaust museum in Israel. And so there's just no way that you come out of that not affected. It's very, very deeply moving and very disturbing. And while I have taught the Holocaust you know, in high school, so not in great depth, but I've taught the Holocaust several times, so I'm pretty comfortable with the topic and understand the basic tenets. Uh, there were many things that I learned that I had never been exposed to by going through this museum. 
And yet, every single one of my traveling companions also echoed this same sentiment, and we all sort of whispered about it when we got back to the hotel because we felt like we couldn't talk about it openly in the company that we were in. It was creepy how it was sort of the same things that were happening in Palestine, right? The ghettoization, uh, the restriction of access uh, to financial security, the, the inability to make decisions for yourself and your family. And, you know, it's not the same, and I don't want to say it's the same, but the, there's really no doubt in my mind that that persecution of the Jewish people um, has influenced the psyche of the culture and gotten twisted in a way that I don't think they want it to be twisted either. It's very interesting. Time for one more question before we uh, break for dinner. I have a question. How did you get selected? Did you have to fill out an application, or, or what was the process for you to get selected as um, seven people? Great question. So I was very fortunate to meet someone who had also been on a trip, and that is how you are selected. You have to be nominated by someone who has been on a trip. Um, so now I get to nominate other people. If you know 25 to 40 year olds who are involved in politics in some way, uh, let me know because I get to nominate people. It's a really cool, cool experience, cool opportunity. You can go anywhere in the world actually with this program. I have a friend who went to Malaysia. Um, they go all over the place, not just the Middle East. Good final question. Let's give a round of applause. Oh, but, uh, John's got one more question. All right, we've got enough time for John. I'll let you ask a question. Actually, I'm not going to ask a question. I just want to make a pitch for we are bringing in two weeks. Um, uh, and uh, Mandy's helping with this. So uh, Ali Amar, who's, or Ali Paris, he changed his name. He's a kanun player, uh, jazz musician. He'll be playing at the, um, uh, the Center for St uh, CCE at the, at the theater on March 14th. Explain what a kanun for, is. A kanun is kind of like an... A Middle Eastern auto harp. It's uh, uh, it's played plucked actually rather than strummed, and uh, he's quite pro, uh, proficient. So he's Palestinian. He's Palestinian, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's March fourteenth at seven o'clock, six thirty in the Center for Civic Engagement. Uh, which is the building across the street. This is a program being sponsored by WIPS, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service that Mandy is also now working for, as well as John Visti. Um, so you might also want to do that. But let's thank Mandy for her insights tonight. Thank you very much. Well, and really quickly, if I can interrupt you, I'd just yes. like to say thank you very much for coming. I think it's actually really inspiring that so many people want to learn about this part of the world. Um, and I feel very, very fortunate to have been chosen to take such a trip. But it would be very difficult to take such a trip and then not have the opportunity to come back and share it with people. So it really is... Uh, important to me personally, as well as I think our entire community, that you come and learn about things and engage in this conversation. So thank you very much for coming.